And uh, so today I wanted to go back and stick with our messages on the Beatitudes. Actually, today we're on the actual last one of the blesseds, when Jesus spoke blessed or blessed or the whatevers. And uh, today is about uh, ble blessed or the peacemakers. This is so, every one of these messages have been so timely for where we are in our society. And it's amazing. I'm amazed at it. And uh, amazing. But today's blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And actually, the subtitle of today is, I give up my rights. Now, that's not a popular subject today, even among Christians, about giving up rights. But it seems like everybody's fighting for their rights. As I was praying this morning and, and looking over the message, Matthew 5, 9 says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be sons of God. And I make this statement, peacemakers are difficult to find because of the process one has to go through to become a peacemaker. When we look at the Beatitudes, Jesus spoke that every one of them built on the one before it, that you couldn't, you couldn't unless you were poor in spirit, then you wouldn't realize you needed to be broken or mourn for your sins, and then you would not have experienced meekness and you would not, and if you didn't experience meekness, you'd have no cause or reason to hunger and thirst for his righteousness. And therefore, hungering and thirsting for his righteousness, you would become merciful because in that you would receive mercy. And then because of that, you'd become pure in heart because you would see and you'd be able to see God because you become single minded. So each one of these that Jesus spoke, the blessed or the blessed, they built on one another. They were conditional to one another. So you'll remember me saying that. Hopefully you will. But and when I was reading and reading over it and praying this morning that what dawned on me when I said this statement, peacemakers are difficult to find because of the process one has to go through to become a peacemaker because that's a process of those previous six. This is the seventh today peacemaker. And it dawned on me that because of willingness, because of a person's willingness, it's all dependent on our willingness to become poor in spirit, willingness to mourn or be broken over our sins, willingness to become weak, willingness to hunger and thirst after his righteousness in his kingdom, willingness to be merciful to others and receive mercy, and then willingness to be pure in heart to be able to see God. And then today it takes the willingness to become a peacemaker. Now we're living, listen, uh, in following, and I've had to follow Facebook more than I ever wanted to. Sylvia's theory is about Facebook. She says, I have enough faces in my book already. I'm not going to do Facebook. So I understand that. I don't, I don't even know how many emails I get a day, still emails. It, it's just, I don't even know. I, it's innumerable. I think there's something like 40-something thousand emails in my box. Most have been read. I do delete some, but still that number is in there, and Sylvia so goes, it, she said, that would drive me nuts, and then people, when they see that they're unread, they said, how do you live with that? I said, I just don't read all of them. I can't, it's, and some of them, I know what they are, and some of them, I delete because they're junk, and uh, some, if you respond, you know how it goes. If you respond to one thing, you get on their list, and then everybody else won't include you on their list. I go, I didn't, I didn't invite you, and same with, th same with Facebook. I go and unfriend people, but I don't even know these people. I, I can't be your friend if I don't know you. Anyway, Facebook. So in, in, in dealing with that, that, that I, I, the go let me just use an example. We've been following the governors twice a week, was three, now twice a week, his, little, uh, his updates. And the, the viciousness of people's comments, not only towards the governor, but towards each other. They start fighting on Facebook. I'm like, y'all are crazy. And they'll, they'll say things on Facebook you'd never say to a person face to face to them. So I don't know why they call it Facebook. Well, in a face, it's in the book. I don't know. Somehow it's easier to say something not in front of the person because they're not going to punch you, I guess, is the reason. Or cuss you out in person. Is there a difference between cussed out, being cussed out in person, than on Facebook? I don't think so, anyway. So, but I'm amazed at what happens on social media to each other. So those, those seven, poor in spirit, mourning, meekness, hunger, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, 
probably until we can, and, and none of us are perfect. Come on, everybody should have said amen on that one. We should have heard them on live stream yelling amen on that one. None of us are perfect. None of us have arrived. None of us got this all figured out yet. Have you figured that out about you? You don't have it all figured out yet. If you haven't, talk to your spouse. Talk to your young person, your, your, your young person in your house. They'll let you know. You don't have it figured out, Dad, yet. You don't have it figured out yet, Mom. We're all in a process. Amen. So, but yet the most difficult probably to achieve because we are in a process would be that of a peacemaker, trying to be a peacemaker, and especially in this era that we're living in right now. But it is especially important that you and I as God's people be careful not to react, not to lash out, <clears throat> not to get involved in the viciousness. We can all state our opinion, but keep it sanctified. Keep it loving. Keep it truthful uh, according to Scripture. And my stand in dealing, here's my personal stand as a Christian, number one, then as a pastor, second. I am not going to fight all that's going on in our culture and our society with the viciousness and the attacking. I'm going to use God's Word to state God's Word because that's the only thing that matters. And... And, you know, and people would come up with a, a lot of remedies uh, for what's going on. But you know what? If a person, if, they're, if these people that are causing all this ruckus, if I can call it that, causing all this, if they don't get born again, they're never going to stop. They're, if, if they quit writing, they're going to go on to something else anyway in their life because their heart's not right. And the only one that can change the heart is the Lord Jesus Yeshua. The only one. The, he, he alone has the power to give us that new heart. So probably the hardest of the Beatitudes to achieve because we have to have some measure of hungering and, and accomplishing the other seven would be a peacemaker in this world of conflict that we're living in. For example, David in Psalm 55, 9. David shares grief over broken relationships among God's people. Not the world, among God's people. He said, I see violence and strife in the city. He was talking about Jerusalem among God's people. He said, the violence did not come from an outside invading army. The violence rose from within. And he said in Psalm 55, later in that chapter, verses 12 through 14, it's not an enemy who taunts me. Then I could bear it. It's not an adversary who deals insolently with me. Then I could hide from him. But it is you a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together within God's house. We walked in among the throng. David knew the pain of betrayal. And here was his response later on in, in uh, Psalm 55, 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Listen, according to that one scripture... No matter what's going on, he will never permit the righteous to be moved. I love what it says in, in Romans 8. There's nothing, no thing, no thing, no principality, no devil, no, no anything that can separate us from God's love. He continually always cares for us. A guy, Tom, a theologian Thomas Watson, he states this. This is so true. Satan kindles the fires of contention in men's heart or people's hearts, and then Satan stands and warms himself at that fire. And I know there's people involved in this, but the one who's really behind it is Satan himself. And that's why it's, the battle's not against flesh and blood, but it's against these principalities and these powers. And as I said earlier, you and I as God's people are the only ones that really have the authority and the tools and the ammunition to deal with what's going on in our society today. And Jesus said it this way, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. He wasn't talking about a building. He was talking about his people, the redeemed ones that, that have the authority and power of his name. So the gates of hell can't stand against. Satan's ministry, he still does have a ministry. But his ministry is to stir up strife, quarreling, 
conflict, division in the hearts of people. And then he steps back and he lets people destroy themselves. He starts it and then kind of ignites it. You know, any of you know a troublemaker? Anybody know a troublemaker? You may have one in your family, an agitator. That's what the devil is. He's a troublemaker and an agitator. He comes and he, he drops a little, uh, a, he drops a little gossip morsel. Really? That, they said that. They did that. And by the time, a fire. And that's what the book of James says. Our tongue is an unruly evil. Galatians 5 says this. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. All the law is fulfilled in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Of course, Jesus showed us who our neighbor was. Is the guy beat up and left for dead that, that the, the good Samaritan didn't even know, but knew, he didn't even know him, but he had the compassion and the heart to stop and help him. He even put out money, put him up in the hotel and said, hey, if, I, if, he run, if he runs up a bill and it's more than I've given you, I'll pay you what it is when I come back through. Tell about homeless people. Love your neighbors yourself. But listen to this, but if you bite Here's what's going on. People are biting and devouring one another. Take heed that you, sh you not be consumed one of another. And that's exactly what's going on. That is very descriptive. People are biting and devouring one another. He said, take heed that you're going to consume each other. The devil initiates this stuff, puts it in the hearts of people that don't know Christ, puts it in the hearts of people that have evil purposes, uh, Many of us as Christians are, are very naive, and we think, well, how could people think like that in the world? Honey, there are some evil folk in the world. And they're inspired, and they're motivated, and some of them are possessed by the enemy, and some of them are controlled by the enemy to do the work of the enemy. And, and those are the ones that Satan uses. So if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you, you're not consumed to one another. But here's the remedy. That say, verse 16, walk in the Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit of love. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Walk in the demonstration of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, of the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the temperance, the meekness against which there is no law. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We, as God's people, are called to seek peace. Not agitate, not jump in, not, not get on all the social media platforms or whatever we do or use. For us, peacemaking, according to Jesus' words in Matthew, peacemaking is not optional for the Christian. It is our calling. We're called to be ambassadors of his kingdom. We're called to be reconcilers, ministers of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 7, 15, God has called us to peace. We're called to peace, meaning we're called to God who gives us peace. He is peace. Romans 12, 18 says, if it be possible, or as much as lies within you, and Amplified says, as far as it depends on you as a child of God, if it's possible, as much as lies or depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. Now, and that's our calling. That's our ministry. That's one of the things we as God's people are supposed to be doing, living at peace with all people as much as possible. Now, I realize there are some people that will not let you live at peace with them. I realize that. So, so Pastor, what do you do about them? You do your part to be at peace with them, and you leave it with them. That's all you can do. If you've got a family member, and we all do, we all got family members. Every one of us in this room are watching. Every one of us has at least one family member that's the knucklehead. And that's trying to be nice this morning of the family. At least, at least we got one. Some of you are blessed with a multitude of those such folk. I'm so sorry. <laughs> he put you there to be light. But what our calling is, as much as is possible, our part is to live at peace with them. If we need to ask forgiveness, we humble ourselves and we ask forgiveness. If they're offended at us for nothing at all, we go to them and say, you know, I'm sorry that you've, you know, that I've offended you and what I do. And I ask for your forgiveness 
And, you know, whether they forgive you or not, you've done your piece, you've done your part, and you leave it with them. Even if you have a deceased relative or friend or somebody you knew that you had odds against, you know, you just, you release that person or you forgive them, and you know, and, and you just release it and you leave it in the hands of the Lord, and that's all you can do. You, then you receive God's peace because you've done everything you can do. And when you've done everything you can do, you just be at peace. So, Lord, I, I put it in your hands. There, there's people in my life that I, had to, I wrestled with forgiving them. I know, I know you've never had the wrestling, mat, wrestling match, but I wrestled with, Lord, I need to forgive them, but I don't want to. And I've learned that forgiveness is not a feeling because you're never going to feel like it because our sense of justice has been offended. But I've learned that feeling, it's a choice. I chose to put socks on today. It was a choice. I chose to brush my teeth today. It was a choice. Aren't you glad? <laughs> and I've really come to realize that when somebody hurts me or offends me or says something or, and doesn't understand or, and goes and tells somebody else and it gets all blown up and out of proportion, I've learned that I have to make a choice not to be offended. If I wait till I felt like it, can I speak some Southern to you? It ain't going to happen if I waited till I felt like it. But it's simply making a choice because the Lord said I could do it. So as much as possible that lies in you, live peacefully. And, and we're, however we're challenged, it's family, it's friends, work associates, neighbors, spouse. Uh, Sylvia's wrestling with masks. She's the worst violator we got. Mine broke so I don't have to wear it. So sad. I'm so sorry. Oh, you went and got me another one. Oh, you bad. You bad. You bad, Darren. You bad. I thought you were on my side, Darren. Mine broke. I simply pulled it off my wrist. And it broke. I said, well, I don't have to wear that. And then he goes and gets me another one. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 3. Being diligent. And here's where we are today, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. How does that work? Jesus has already accomplished, defeated the devil, accomplished victory so you could have peace with God, right? Now that you have peace with God, our part, your part, is to preserve that unity that the Holy Spirit has brought into your life. Now, that's a challenge for all of us because you're going to, Jesus said in himself, you can't live in this life, in this world without being offended. It's impossible, but woe be to the one that causes the offense. So don't be an offense causer. You're going to get offended. There's no way to escape it, but choose. And here's another choice. Choose not to be easily offended. Just choose not to be easily offended. Some people say, oh, that didn't bother me, but it, yet it really did bother them. But you have, you have to choose not to be easily offended. You have to choose to preserve this unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Listen, if we start acting like the rest of the world, there's no answers. They need to see a church. They need to see the people of God that have the answers, that are living, walking in peace and love and grace, and that are peacemakers. This world needs to see it right now, right now. And if you've lost your peace, you do your best to restore it. Proverbs 12, 20 says this, counselors of peace have joy. Counselors of peace have joy. Those who plan or make plans for peace have joy. It's a deliberate, intentional working at it, and it takes it. Uh, you have to lay steps out to make it. it doesn't just, it's not just happenstance. Now, where does peace come from? Peace of heart flows from a purity of life. Peace of heart flows from a purity of life. You cannot have peace with others if you don't have peace within yourself first. Peace with God, that's the starting place. You can't have peace with other people. You're always going to be mad, upset, ticked off, offended, wounded, hurt, violated. You put the title to it. You, can't, you cannot have peace for other, with others if you don't have peace with yourself. 
It really goes along with what Jesus said, love others as you love yourself. You do have to have a measure of acceptance and love for yourself, respect for yourself before you can actually love others in the right way. That's not being narcissistic and, and, and loving yourself in that way, but it's you do have to have a respect and a love for yourself, a wholesome respect for yourself before you can really honestly in the right way love other people. An unresolved conflict in your heart, it's a hindrance to being a peacemaker to other people. Romans 6, 16, 17, and Titus 3, 10, it gives direction to warning a divisive person people that cause division through their word, their mouth, and their attitudes. It gives directions to warning a divisive person and those who cause divisions that if they don't stop, don't have fellowship with them. Unfriend them from your Facebook, your your tweet line. I've known people that said to me recently, they said, through all of this stuff that's going on, I've have to unfriend some people because they, they went off on this end and they went off on that end. I said, man, it just got vicious. And like I said, when I was just watching the governor's uh, uh, updates, the viciousness that's on there, I said, and and where it says, they they give a little piece of it, and it says other, where the rest of what they said, I'm not even going to touch that button. It was bad enough what I heard, what I saw, what I read. But it says, don't have fellowship with them, lest you become corrupted by their attitudes. James 3.17 describes peace as a result of pursuing peace purity. The wisdom from above is first purer than peaceable. Peace flows from a pure heart. James 4, 1 through 3 explains where all of our quarrels, misunderstandings come from. It says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Why are people fighting like they're fighting today? Here's the answer. Is it not your source of your pleasures that wage war in your members, I'm not getting what I want, so I'm going to do what I do. You lust, you do not have, so you commit murder. You're envious, you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask, and you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your own pleasures. So it's the motivation, it's the heart out of purity that does not have peace. When we have that purity and that peace in our heart, we will have the purity of our heart. Impure hearts are divided hearts, so they become divisive. Isaiah 57, 21 says this, there is no peace for the wicked. Well, it sure looks like they're getting their way and having their time and having their day, doesn't it? Sure looks that way, doesn't it? Man, how do they get away with this? But the Bible clearly said there is no peace for the wicked. They can burn, they can break, they can voice, they can scream, they can tear up, they can whatever. But they don't have peace because their heart's not pure. Listen, the people that act like they got their life together when they don't have Jesus, it's a sham. It's a fake. It's all the stuff that they built around them, whatever it is, their possessions or whatever it is, their possessions or their position It's all the sham that they built up around them that is the impression that they've got it all together and they're just okay, they're fine. Now, there's some people that are actually deceived and just the spirit of stupid is really heavy on them. But the Bible doesn't say that, but it didn't take much to figure that out. So there's no peace for the wicked because the only source of peace in the heart is the Lord. He is it. He is bottom line. He is where you're going to find peace. You're not going to find it in this world. So there is no peace for the wicked. The more you pursue purity, and this is for us, the more we pursue purity of heart and make sure our heart is right with God and our heart is right with people as much as is possible as lies within us, the more you pursue purity, the more you will enjoy peace. That is how we're going to maintain and not just maintain but have victory in this time of chaos and confusion in our nation. We live in purity. We will enjoy peace. And the more you give way to impurity, the more conflicted and restless you'll become. The more you enter into what they're doing, you'll lose your peace. Why are peacemakers called the sons of God? Why did Jesus say that? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called, known as, the sons of God. 
sons of God are people who reflect his image. We're talking about Father's Day. We're talking about, you know, sons and fathers and male influence and mentorship. That's all surrounding not only just the day, but should be surrounding our, our, our fatherhood and what we do as both natural and spiritual fathers for, for young men and for others. But 1 John 3 says this, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has that hope of seeing him purifies him or herself even as he, the Lord, is pure. We say, well, like father, like son, or we say things like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree to see a similarity or a likeness in families or someone or a father, son, or mother and daughter or children to parents. Peacemakers are called sons of God, and I want to give you just real quick just some of these points. Peacemakers are called sons of God because we are like our heavenly father who not only has peace in himself, but who is peace. He is peace. We say, well, God, God, God loves you. God, God, it's not that God has to love you. God's going to love you because he is love. That's just who he is. He doesn't have to decide to love you. He doesn't have to decide to forgive you. That's who he is. That's his character. It's never going to change. He, he, he is never going to change. Peacemakers are like our heavenly father because he is peace within himself, and he lives in us. Romans 15, 33, and 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, Hebrews 13, 20, tell us, tells us he is the God of peace. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they're in unity of purpose and will. They always have been. They always will be. They're not conflicted. Isaiah 9, 6 calls Jesus, our Savior, the Prince of Peace. Luke 2, 14, the angels declared when he, Christ Yeshua, came into the world, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace and goodwill towards men. That was God's message. I'm sending the Messiah so that now you can have peace on earth. Peace with God and peace with other people because your heart is reconciled to God. Colossians 1, 19 and 20 says, he came into this world to make peace by the shedding of his blood on the cross. It was costly. Matthew 3, 16 says, When Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit manifested as a dove, which is the symbol of peace. In John 20, I love this, 20, 21, and 22, the post-resurrected Jesus appeared to his disciples, and what did he say to them? First thing he said to them, Peace be with you. Why? Because they were, they were very much afraid. They were afraid they were next. They were locked away behind closed doors out of fear of the Jews, it said, that they were next. He speaks to them and said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. The peacemaker gives peace to his disciples so that they may share this gospel, good news, and bring others into that same peace that they'd received. That's why you're still here today. That is your purpose. Your purpose is not to go to your job, receive a check, Deposit it in your account, pay your bills, eat your food, pay your, your mortgage payment, send your kids to school, or enjoy whatever you do in life. That's not your main purpose. You are, you are still here on planet Earth as a child of God so that you will share the peace of God he's given you to those that do not have the peace. You have a mission. You have a purpose that is greater than anything else that you think you can do with your life and earn, earning or doing or business or, or your occupation or your interest or your hobbies or anything. Your purpose, why he saved you and left you here, is for you to be a testimony of the peace of God to those that have not found him yet. That's the greatest purpose there is. So the first thing, you're peace, we're peacemakers like our Heavenly Father because he's peace. Second... We are called peacemakers. The sons of God are called peacemakers because we're like God because we've surrendered our rights. That's the title of this message. Now, here's where it gets tough on us because we live in a world that everybody wants their way. Everybody wants their rights. Everybody feels entitlement. Everybody feels like they, they are owed, that they deserve that, you know, that everybody feels that way. And what's happening is the attitude, that spirit, and it is a spirit of entitlement, it has affected us as God's people. We feel like, well, they owe us this. And there are situations that 
we are owed justice and we are owed some things. The laws of the land say so. But may I suggest to you and remind you, yes, we're in this world, but Jesus said you're not really of this world, that we do live in subjection to the laws of this land, but yet we live in honor to a greater kingdom that we are a citizen of, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, that is a greater kingdom. Come on, church. That's who we really are. Everything in this life is temporary, and we focus on the temporary, and we fail to really put the emphasis on that which we can't see, which is the eternal, which is coming very rapidly. The, the rate that things are happening right now, the kingdom of God is approaching very rapidly. Jesus coming. I know we don't hear a lot that said or preached a lot. Jesus is coming, is rapidly approaching, folks. The signs of the time. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. I'm not afraid. I am like a little alarmed. I'm going, man, I didn't think it was going to get this bad before Jesus had to come. But, well, and I'm saying this to myself, dummy, didn't you read the word? Yeah, I read the word. Well, that's what it says. Evil men are going to wax worse and worse. There's going to come a great falling away. That the love of many will, the love, sin will abound so much that the love of many will wax, grow cold. You see the signs in nature and see the signs in the world, not only in people, but in nature. The earth is freaking out, if we could say it that way. It's groaning. It's crying out for the redemption. Jesus is coming. And you and I need to live in this world, but yet not be controlled by this world, not be manipulated by this world, not let this world live. You say, Pastor, where do you, where do you stand when, when the governor or the president or the mayor makes a proclamation? Where do you stand? And there's a, it, here's, a, here's a balance, or there, there's got to be a balance for us. The Bible calls us to, be, to honor the laws of the land. Yes. Romans 13, God places these people in their positions to keep peace. Actually, it's to protect the good people. And to, to, to prosecute the evil. That's how it's supposed to work. Now, I know, just like in the days of Isaiah, he said, this thing gets flipped. The evil get away and the, and the good get prosecuted. And that, that's, that's what happens when evil reigns. That's just what happens when evil reigns. But that's not God's kingdom and it's not the way it should be. Amen. So we obey the laws of the land as long as, according to Acts 4, they don't ask us to disobey God. When they ask us to disobey God, there is a line drawn, and it, your line better be already drawn. You draw a line in the sand, said, I'm not going any further than this. I'll obey the laws of the land, and, and, and practical, we're trying to keep you safe. We're encouraging you to wear a mask. When you leave here today, I'm going to ask you to leave in a certain way, orderly way, so your paths don't have to cross and you keep social distance. But I'm not... This is recorded, so who cares? I'm not putting X's in the parking lot and somebody tell you when you can get out of your car and approach the front of the building and, and put X's on the floor and tell you I'm not going there. I'm not going there. I'm not going there. If, you, if your mask breaks accidentally and comes off during worship, we're not going to uh, 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 escort you out. And I know there's more serious things that we're going to have to do. Folks, if I, I got to be honest with you. We're in the last days. We are rapidly approaching the manifestation and the fulfillment. They're going to come for us. I didn't come to church here. Pastor, I want to hear a message. That, help me. Well, this is going to help you because if you're not ready, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna get caught. If you're not ready, you're going to get caught. You better be making up your mind. Now, you should have had it made up a long time ago, but if you don't, you better make up your mind real quick where you're going to stand with the Lord. You better make up your mind because they're coming after us. This, this, whole, this whole thing, I, I, believe the COVID, I, I believe the COVID-19 could kill you if you get it. We've got some people sitting here that survived it. We had about four people in this congregation that had it, were hospitalized, and survived it. Thank God. It has the potential to kill you. 
But most people are recovering from it and they're okay. That's the truth too. So trying to balance all that out. So if, if in, in those of you that are live streaming and you're not here today because you don't feel safe, we don't judge you. We don't condemn you. You come when you feel safe. That's, that's between you, your family, and the Lord. And that, that's, I don't judge you. Nobody's upset at you for that. But yet at the same time, there comes a limit that says, I've had enough. Because a lot of this is simply trying to, them trying to see how far they can control us and manipulate us and how we're going to react and re we're going to respond. It's a lot of it. You may not agree with that, and that's okay. That's your right and that's your privilege. But they're just trying to see how much control they can get away with. And they're going to try to tighten the controls. You know, you've heard all the arguments. How can rioters and looters get out there and spit, foam, and rub against each other and do all they're doing and not wear a mask and then we're restricted to come to church? I mean, that's just one conflict that we obviously see there. So, Boy, I blew that point just totally. Wow. Well, let's go on to number three because I'm not trying to keep you here long. Third, peacemakers are like God. Because we move towards trouble, we don't run away from it. <laughs> wow. Jesus is the best example. He said, I came into the world not to bring peace, but a sword. I remember when I received Jesus, I lost friends or people I thought were friends. I remember when I accepted the Lord, I threw my family for a loop. Some of them acted towards me that they'd rather I live the old life than this new life of always talking about Jesus, going to church, praying and reading the Bible and being a Christian. You, you, will, you will cause division when you follow Jesus. Jesus caused division when he came into the world and preached the gospel. He did not intentionally offend people, but you living and telling the truth will offend people. But you've, you and I have to be determined that that is the true, that's our role. It's not, to, it's not in a vicious or mean way, but it is in a, a godly way to present the truth to them, to bring them. We're ministers of reconciliation, to bring them to God. And that means we have to tell them the truth so that they can come to peace with God. And in doing that, it's going to offend some people. He came, he came to bring peace between God and man. And when he, when he moved that, it stirred up stuff. It always stirs up religious devils. The last one, peacemakers are like God because they, they love others before they're loved in return. God loves us while we're yet a sinner. It says in Romans 5, 8, if you ever wonder, well, ever, you know, people, people feel this way sometimes, Christians do. Well, I don't know if God loves me. I'm just not sure if he loves me. I wish God would show me he loved me. I always, and I used to say that until I found Romans 5, 8, and I point them to Romans 5, 8. Well, I want to tell you something. God already showed how much he loved you. God already demonstrated how much he loved you. And that while you were yet a sinner, he died. He sent his son to die for you. While you're out there cursing his name, fornicating, adulterating, and doing everything else. While you were yet a sinner, he showed you how much he loved you by dying for you. Before you were ever thought of, hatched, or became a little weeble in this world. The Lord calls upon our hearts to love as he loved. Ephesians 4, 30, 32. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Wow. Here's how we can grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Here's how you can grieve the Holy Spirit. He said, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, which is fighting, and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Malice is hatred. That's how we grieve the Holy Spirit. As a Christian, that's how we grieve the Holy Spirit. You have bitterness, 
You're, you're not willing to forgive. You're, you're bitter towards a person. You have wrath. You have anger. You want to fight, whether it's physical fighting or just in your, in your mind you're fighting. You're resisting. And, and you slander. You're talking about them. It says, let all that be put away from you along with all hatred. And then here's the positive side of that. But as a child of God, as a Christian, as a peacemaker, be kind to one another, tenderhearted. Wow. It's hard to find people tenderhearted nowadays. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. You know, I go back to that. Well, how did God forgive you? I always think of this. There were no strings attached. God didn't say, well, you, when, when, you start doing this, when you stop doing all this sin and you clean your act together, when you stop smoking, cursing, cussing, whatever you want to call it, uh, fornicating, adultery, adultery and, and lying or cheating or stealing or, you know, whatever, God doesn't sit there and say, when you stop all that and you get on the road to recovery, I'll take a look at you and we'll talk about you becoming my, my son, my daughter, and my family. It's a good thing God didn't do that or he would never have found me. I'd have never made it. And I hate to break the bad news to you, but neither would you. Neither would you. But while we were yet sinners, some of us were bad news. I mean, we're out there doing the worst of the worst against God, against people, even against the people of God. You look at people like Saul who became Paul. He's out there having Christians arrested, killed, imprisoned, tortured because of their faith. If God can save that guy, God can save the worst one in your family. Because God, just like God had a reason and a purpose for Saul who became Paul, God has a reason and a purpose for your loved one or that friend or that work associate. Whoever's on your heart, heavy on your heart, so how has God forgiven us? He demonstrates it while we're yet sinners. So being a peacemaker, and this is a quote, being a peacemaker is nothing less than to displace the inner self from the inner throne. You've got to take yourself off the throne. I've got to take myself off the throne. You've got to take yourself off the throne. Displace ourselves from that inner throne. And then enthrone Christ, enthrone Yeshua. He is Lord. And, not, and to, to not make the slightest compromise, even with the smallest sin in our life. Church people are looking at us. The world is looking at us, wondering, is there anybody that really knows God? Is there anybody that lives this life? And you and I have been silent for too long. And some of, some of us... Some of us are scared to witness to other people because we feel like, I don't live the life that measures up. You may not be perfect. And, and to be honest with you, you do need to get your act together in Jesus. But you're not going to be perfect. But they need to see a, a person that lives before them, that loves Jesus, that walks with God. And they need, they need to see your humanness. That's what I love about this series. We're sh showing the chosen. It shows the humanness of these people that Jesus picked to follow him. It's just like you and me. They need to see that humanness in us. But they need to see the greatness of Jesus and how he's transformed us. That there's hope in this crazy, mixed up world. That it is so full of hate. We need to enthrone Christ. We need to walk with God all day long. We need to abide with him every hour. We need to love the Lord with all of our heart and our neighbor as ourselves. So just in closing today, I don't even think this yet. I don't even think the conclusion's up there. Number one, what the Holy Spirit, what this message is telling us to do about being a peacemaker is search your heart and make sure you've received the righteousness and peace with God that he offers to you. Two, surrender your rights and become a servant just like Jesus was and is a servant. He came to seek and to save that which is lost, not to be served. And then three, don't, don't avoid the opportunities to be a peacemaker. Don't run from them, but run to those opportunities to be a peacemaker when the opportunities present themselves. Fourthly, we are called to love like God and Christ Yeshua does before someone even loves us first, to love them in spite of themselves, in spite of how they act, 
in spite of what they do. This is who you and I are, are called to be and left here to accomplish for the kingdom of God until you draw your last breath or until Jesus Yeshua comes. This is our mission. It's not to fight with people. It's to love them. It's to stand for truth, stand for righteousness, and glorify the Lord and be a peacemaker. Amen. Would you stand together with me this morning?